As you know, last week we came to the point where we were half through with our study of the 12 disciples of the English Bible by studying about Erasmus. And if um, you'll allow me a little reviewing with this slide, we had three of the disciples of the English Bible that were the ancients, that were the ones that were upholding the faith of the fathers, and then three that were preserving the faith of the fathers toward our English Bible. And now we're going to enter into these last six, starting with William Tyndale, uh, and these three refining, and three doing mostly distributing of the English Bible. <clears throat> so when we talk about refining, we're talking about refining into the English, not changing the originals or any of that, but refining into our English language during the right time. So tonight is William Tyndale. So he gave us the New Testament in English in 1525 to 1526. He also revised that, which we'll talk about tonight, in 1528 and 9, and then again in 1534 for the final. And we'll talk about why that was. But as the slide shows us, Tyndale studied at Magdalen Hall, Oxford, where he was exposed often to the teachings of, guess who? Erasmus. The Oxford Dictionary of National Biographies notes the source of his vocation to the cause of reform is most likely to have been the arrival of this, Erasmus's printing of the original Greek New Testament. It's very possible probable that it was from this influential volume that Tyndale led his private studies. And so right there we're seeing the fact that Tyndale was at Oxford and there was this contingent of progressives that were not still married to the uh, Catholic Church and who were studying privately the New Testament that had been uh, put together that had the Latin on one side, the Latin Vulgate, and the Greek original on the other side put together by Erasmus that we talked about last week and <clears throat> that Tyndale was a devotee of, <clears throat> of that. Sorry. <clears throat> so, William Tyndale, English scholar and priest. And let's not forget, he was a Catholic priest until the time that he started reading the original Greek and said, wait a minute. We, we are not doing the right things. He's frequently referred to as the architect of the English language, even more so than William Shakespeare, as so many of the phrases Tyndale coined are still in our language today. <clears throat> so he was at Magdalen College in Oxford, and he was quite the young scholar. He enrolled at Oxford in 1505 and grew up at the university. He received his master's degree in 1515 at the age of 21. He proved to be a gifted linguist. One of Tyndale's associates commented that Tyndale was so skilled in eight languages, Hebrew, Greek, Latin, Spanish, French, Italian, English, and German, that whichever he speaks, you might think it's his native tongue. And Martin Luther, when uh, Tyndale went to stay with him and visit with him for a number of months, said the same thing about Tyndale in one of his letters. He said, you would think Tyndale was born a German. Uh, he speaks German with such a great uh, fluence and um, that he is, uh, has, seems to have no 
accent of a foreigner. So here's where we get into some trouble. A Catholic priest once taunted Tyndale with the statement, we are better to be without God's laws than the Pope's. Tyndale was infuriated by such Roman Catholic heresies and he replied, I defy the Pope and all his laws. If God spare my life ere many years, I will cause the boy that drives the plow to know more of the scriptures than you. And so um, he was a little feisty and fiery and he should have been. Anybody that says the Pope's laws uh, if we have to lose one or the other, let's lose God's law and keep the Pope's laws. Is not correct. Somebody that we should be infuriated with. So let's look at some of what Tyndale coined that were never known in the English language uh, until he came along. During translation, Tyndale coined such familiar phrases as, let there be light, he did do the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, much of the Old Testament. We'll talk about that. But the interesting thing is Luther translated Genesis 1-3 as es wert licht, meaning it will be light. And so Tyndale took those kinds of things and said, God's words said, let there be light instead of it will be light. Much better for English understanding than that. He said, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. In the twinkling of an eye. All the, um, all the languages that had started to be translated at that point in time. Spanish, German and uh, Swiss and English, they were saying things like um, in the blink of an eye or in a short time span. And Tyndale, understanding the original Greek, he said, how can I say this? How can I say this? Um, it's not any time at all in the original intent of the Greek. And so he coined that that word, the twinkling of an eye. <clears throat> Seek and you shall find, eat, drink, and be merry. Ask and it shall be given you. Judge not that you not be judged. The powers that be, the salt of the earth, gave up the ghost. The spirit is willing, but the fresh flesh is weak. And live and move and have our being. When uh, the original Greek was translated in several languages, including Martin Luther's German, which was just before Tyndale was doing the English, uh, the German said, uh, in him we have consistent life and we have our selves. And it didn't quite make that into English that way uh, because Tyndale wanted it to be more, um, more bright, more interactive with our souls. And he said, in him we live and move and have our being. And it was much more clear and it was much closer to the original Greek. Tyndale coined such familiar verses as, Even so, then at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the selection of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. That's from Romans 11, 5 and 6. The Latin Vulgate had a tendency to obfuscate the verses like this. And some believe they did it actually on purpose. So in the Latin Vulgate, it said, at the present, there is a remnant of grace. Grace is not works and works not grace. And so they could parse that out and say, and so grace is not works and works is not grace. And so you have grace and you have works. And so you have to do works in order to gain your salvation. See how that's 
obfuscated and kind of unclear uh, so that they could get their tradition in there. And Tyndale said then, now that we know that, let's read it again. Even so, then at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the selection of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. So he's clarifying the original Greek there from the Latin Vulgate. And so he does this over and over and over and over again as he works it into the English language. <clears throat> so they didn't like him very well. <clears throat> the place where he translated the New Testament is thought to have been Wittenberg under the protection of Martin Luther. The printing of this English New Testament was begun at Cologne in the summer of 1525 and completed at Worms in Germany. And so this is the facing page. This is actually the facing page of the 1536. I could not find a facing page of the earlier versions. So we'll have to do with that. Now let's see if we can go through a very interesting human interest story. How many of you have ever heard of Augustine Packington? Well, Augustine Packington was a sailor merchant. He owned several ships that went back and forth across the English Channel, picking up wares, taking commodities, and uh, having trade with the continent continent. Well, after Tyndale completed his first version of the New Testament, they printed 2,000 of those little New Testaments. And as soon as they landed in England from the continent where they were printed, if they could be found by the Catholic hierarchy there, they were immediately burned. And Bishop Tunstall was the Bishop of London that was in charge of trying to confiscate all these New Testaments that were coming over from exiled William Tyndale. And uh, it was illegal, as you know, to have a New Testament in English. It was the only legal New Testament were the ones in Latin and only those that were part of the Catholic hierarchy were allowed to have a copy. Nobody was allowed to have a copy even in the Latin unless you were part of the clergy or had or royalty and had some power to get one. And so Bishop Tunstall came to Augustine Packington when he had come to uh, the docks in London and he said, uh, I need you to go over and see when you're going doing your merchandising back and forth and see if you can find William Tyndale because everybody's been trying to find him and nobody can find him but I bet you might be able to if you sleuth it out. And so when you do, go ahead. I will give you money. You go ahead and buy all of them over there so we don't have to uncover them over here that have been smuggled into the country. So many people are reading the New Testament in English and it's just infuriating us that they're doing that. It's against the law. And so Packington said, all right, I will go over there and see what I can do. Well, Bishop Tunstall did not know that Augustine Packington was a secret Lollard. And he uh, was in favor of the New Testament. As a matter of fact, some of his ships had actually already smuggled in some of the New Testaments. And so when... Augustine Packington went back to the continent. He sought out William Tyndale and he said, Bishop Tunstall has given me a lot of money to buy 
the New Testaments over here so that they don't get into London. And William Tyndale said, oh, thank goodness, I've got a new updated version that I really have wanted to put out there because I was in too much of a hurry the first time and there's some nuances that I've added and I just really want to get that out. So why don't you take all the ones that I have left and you take them back to Bishop Tunstall and he can burn those and I'll use the money to print more of the updated version. And that's what he did. And so 6,000 copies of Tyndale's first translation were printed and smuggled into England, hidden inside bales of wool and wine cast with false bottoms. A merchant named Augustine Packington was a secret supporter of Tyndale and sailed at the behest of the bishop to get all the copies of Tyndale's Bible for him to burn. And as John Fox put it in his famous book of martyrs, the bishop said, Do your diligence, Master Packington. Get them for me and I will pay whatsoever they cost, for I intend to burn them all at Paul's cross. Packington forward, uh, forwarded the prophets to Tyndale, and so as Fox said, the Bishop of London had the books, Packington had the thanks, and Tyndale had the money to print double of his revised New Testaments. God will not be mocked. So, Tyndale completed not only that updated version, but one more in uh, 1534. Meantime, he also translated much of the Old Testament from Hebrew and Greek Septuagint manuscripts, most of which he had to accomplish twice due to the shipwreck loss of his original translation. And I think we mentioned that last week in our discussion, but we may have not gotten it on uh, to the video. And so what I will repeat happened, he finished the Pentateuch, and he finished Job and uh, Jonah and several of the other uh, major prophets and minor prophets. And he was about to uh, take them from one port in Germany over to a port in Holland to have it printed. And so it was manuscripts that he had painstakingly uh, translated by hand and they were in his trunk and they put the trunks on board but then they, he noticed that the, the uh, gendarmes were there and were looking to get him so he didn't get on board and the trunk went on without him and the ship wrecked and when the ship wrecked and went down he lost all of that and he had to spend another year painstakingly translating it again. This time he went overland and took it to the printers. And we have that in our possession today. And Miles Coverdale, actually, that we'll talk about next week, uh, got all of that information and finished the rest of the Old Testament for Tyndale after his death. An interesting thing that people don't recognize sometimes is the human aspect of some of our scholars. Though Tyndale was a brilliant scholar and linguist, he was also a passionate pastor of people. He spent five days each week in translation and two days of every week doing Christian work. On one day of the week he preached in a secluded location because he was being hunted and on one day he went incognito to the slums and brought food to the people. So he would do this week after week, month after month, year after year, all the time running from and hiding because the Catholics were looking for him in order to kill him. And so he also wrote during that time other tracts. The one that we want to pay most attention to here because it has a lot of interconnections we can talk about is The Obedience of a Christian Man. Now this is the title that he gave and you may think, oh, uh, 
Pastor Mac has uh, misspelled Christian. No, that's the way they wrote it back in Middle English. The obedience of a Christian man and how Christian rulers ought to govern, wherein also, if thou mark diligently, thou shalt find eyes to perceive the crafty convenience of all jugglers. So, what does that mean? What it means is that William Tyndale came out with this booklet that was called The Obedience of a Christian Man. And it came out in 1528 while he was in exile and translating, uh, doing updates to his New Testament that we've already talked about. So why is this important and why is it called the obedience of a Christian man? What Tyndale was trying to do was get Henry VIII to break away from the Catholic Church. And he was advocating Caesaropapism, which means the divine right of kings. And we've all heard of the divine right of kings and how kings began to uh, appropriate and usurp the power of the Pope uh, to themselves so that they could uh, get all that good uh, Catholic money and, uh, and property and not be under the Pope's thumb for everything the Pope wanted to do. And it, it's believed that the book greatly influenced Henry VIII's decision in declaring the act of supremacy by which he became the supreme head of the Church of England in 1534. Now, we have this page that's the opening page of the obedience of a Christian man that Tyndale wrote. So, who is this young lady that was... Henry VIII's second wife. Anybody? Anne Boleyn. So Anne Boleyn was a Christian who was wanting Henry to marry her over Catherine of Aragon and who was a Catholic. So she was a Protestant and she actually brought this to Henry VIII and asked him to read it. And he read it and it was all about the divine right of kings not to pay attention to what the Pope wanted. And of course Henry wanted to get a divorce from Catherine of Aragon and the Pope said no, you can't be divorced from her because she's a good Catholic and you need to be a good Catholic too and stick it out. And Catherine did not provide a male heir and that was what Henry was most interested in was a male heir to the throne and so he wanted to divorce her Mary Anne Boleyn and indeed he did do that and a lot of it is uh, given credit to the obedience of a Christian man and we'll talk a little bit about what was in there but who's this lady over here? Anybody know? Elizabeth we have some historians here. Um, Elizabeth I, and whose daughter was she? Anne Boleyn. So she protected the Protestant Reformation because of all of this intrigue that happened. And as she was growing up, she knew what her mother did. She knew the obedience of a Christian man. And she knew her father had accepted the divine right of kings and kicked the Catholic Church out and brought on the Church of England and Protestantism to the islands. So this is something that Tyndale was able to put into great words supported by the real word of God and it had repercussions throughout the centuries. So from start to finish this booklet is about the Bible and the neglect and distortion of it by the institution of the church. The book begins with a preface, a warm pastoral letter encouraging the Christian reader to expect tribulation for the sake of the gospel and to persevere through it. The book 
does three main things. It has, it's in three sections. Sets out God's law of obedience for all people, children, wives, servants, citizens, and rulers. It teaches rulers, fathers, husbands, masters, landlords, and kings or judges how to rule under the word of God and within the church that is the real, should be the real purveyor of God's will on earth. And third, it discusses signs, true signs that are scriptural, such as the two memorial sacraments of baptism and the body and blood of Christ, or false signs such as false sacraments and the worship of saints. And so the obedience of a Christian man holds up to scrutiny the practice of the Catholic Church and how it has been distorted and neglected from the original uh, Hebrew and Greek and holds up what Protestants now believed and what Catholics now believed and said, here's the choice. You need to make a choice. And uh, eventually, Henry made the choice to allow the Protestant church under him. Well, this did not endear Tyndale with the authorities on the continent. And he couldn't go back to England because Henry was still allowing the men who were of the Catholic Church to be his prelates and to be the system to still go on. He wanted peace in his kingdom and he said, I'm going to have my own church, but it's not really like this Martin Luther church and it's certainly not like those people of the Swiss brethren who are coming out, who come out with the uh, Geneva Bible uh, or who would come out with the G Geneva Bible but were putting their tracts out all over Europe and all over England through the Lollards. And so Tyndale couldn't go back to England because he would be arrested there and probably sent to some dungeon of the papacy and he was still being tracked in the, um, on the continent. Well, he was betrayed by a friend and that's a whole story all on its own but we won't go into the details of it but once he was betrayed and arrested they had a trial and here were the six heresies of the trial of Tyndale. They said he maintains that faith alone justifies. Well, that's what we believe. He maintains that to believe in the forgiveness of sins and to embrace the mercy offered in the gospel was enough for salvation. He avers that human traditions cannot bind the conscience except where their neglect might occasion scandal. He denies that there is any purgatory. He affirms that neither the virgin nor the saints pray for us in their own person. And he asserts that neither the virgin nor the saints should be invoked by us. So Tyndale was messing up their whole system. They had a beautiful, wonderful, complete system of shearing the sheep of Christ. And Tyndale was messing up that whole thing for the Pope and his magistrate. And so they took him eventually after 10 months in a dungeon in a castle in Holland. They took him to uh, the, the burning post and they asked, would you, because you were a priest, we have the option of being kind to you. Would you like for us to be kind to you? And he said, yes, please be kind to me. And what that meant was they would strangle him through holes that a rope was put through on the post and kill him first before they lit the fire so that he would feel the flame. So if you were clergy, you had certain perks. And that was to be strangled first and then your body burned. And so he was. 
On October 6th, 1536, his last words were, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. And of course, that, was, that prayer was answered three years later in the fact of King Henry VIII's allowance of and distribution into all English churches of the 1539 English Great Bible. And so uh, the, the Bible, including all of Tyndale's work in the New Testament and his work in the Old Testament, finished by, finished by Coverdale during this three years lapse while uh, after he was, uh, Tyndale was burned at the stake. And in 1539, they published an entire Bible in English that Henry VIII then, because he had finally broken away from the papacy fully and had his own church, own Church of England. But of course, there would still be problems with the Church of England because as we know, the all of the... Uh, priests and bishops and cardinals and archbishops when Henry took over he said now you guys can all go into exile or you can change over and be priests of my church the Church of England so all those guys who had been for the Pope one month the very next month they were all for Henry and they were they were the same people and some didn't. Some went into exile and went to Italy or went to France or went to other places in the continent. But most of them stayed right there and said, okay, we can live with that. We don't want to leave our home country and leave all the perks that we have and go into exile. So we'll just say whatever you want us to say, Henry. And, he, and, and they did. Uh, but the burning of William Tyndale was not an isolated event, and we need to mention that here. This is a page out of Fox's Book of Martyrs. Uh, John Fox is here, and he put out his first edition of Fox's Book of Martyrs, which is, if you've ever seen any originals, they are three huge volumes. The books are about yay by yay and three inches thick, and there are three volumes of them with pictures and stories of the martyrs of the church. It's estimated that the church under the popes and royalty who catered to them, martyred over a million Christians for their faith during uh, the years 1000 to 1800 AD and exiled a million more and confiscated their properties and goods for the Roman church. And this has been well documented and some well documented even by the Catholic church the Spanish Inquisition comes to mind where it was documented that uh, they've got lists and lists and lists and account books where they um, burned people at the stake or exiled them and took all their property and gave it to the Pope for his use. So, what is Tyndale's legacy as we finish up tonight? His translations were made directly from the available originals with the aid of Erasmus 1516 Greek Latin New Testament and he did the Old Testament from the best available Hebrew texts. We've had some updates in the last 400 years and so uh, we have a, a, a better Bible now even than he had before. Nearly a century later, when translators of the authorized or King James Version debated how to best translate the original languages, eight of ten times they agreed that Tyndale had it best to begin with. No person has more influenced what we know of and believe in from our English Bible as William Tyndale. So, there it is for tonight. And next week, we will go along and we will see his, um, one of his protégés, uh, uh, Miles Coverdale, and then uh, we'll see also John Rogers, and we'll hear their stories next week. So, 
as we uh, go into discussion, let me pray and then we'll go into discussion together uh, about all of this.